But this is quite a lot of work that we're going to go through. But today, fine, relax. This is all going to be sort of quite backgroundy stuff. Uh, I don't mean relax in the sense of don't hang on to it. Um, but we're not going to get into the specifics of any of those things, I think, today. So the whole topic goes back about a century and a half and, and to some really famous names, Faraday, Maxwell, and so on, um, who, through a series of experiments that were sort of gradually stitched together intellectually, as it were, over time, uh, established that if you passed an electric current through a wire, you could generate a magnetic field, right? You could make a compass needle change direction. That was a very early <coughs> experiment. Well, that's one of Faraday's experiments. Um, but then it gets a little bit more complicated because uh, if you change the magnetic field, so in other words, if you wave a magnet around in the vicinity of a wire, you could generate a changing electrical current in that wire. No batteries involved, in other words. All right, so that was another interesting observation. And then the absolute killer experiment, uh, a changing current in one wire, so not a changing magnetic field now, a changing current in one wire, uh, would generate a changing magnetic field around it, which would induce a changing electric current and magnetic field in another wire at a distance. So in other words, not part of the same circuit. All right, put all those things together and we end up with electromagnetic waves. In other words, energy is created in one place, transferred through space and picked up in another place. Yeah? Um, and essentially that's where it came from. So what is it? Well, uh, it's electric and magnetic fields, as I've already indicated. Um, so. <coughs> in, I think all textbooks you'll find the field strength denoted either by E or B uh, for electric or magnetic fields. Um, they are all the same. It right? doesn't matter whether it's radio waves or cosmic rays. Um, all electromagnetic waves are fundamentally the same. We've chosen to split them up into a spectrum that we attach names and labels to but they are all EM waves, so they all travel at the speed of light, right? which in vacuum is about 3 times 10 to the uh, 8 meters per second. All right? The way we split them up uh, comes entirely empirically. It comes from you know, how we generate them, how we detect them. Um, so they were discovered, basically, different parts of the EM spectrum were, were, were studied over time, historically, depending on how instrumentation and devices and so on were developed and improved. Um, and that's a lot of where the labeling comes from. All right, now both these fields, so the electric field and the magnetic field, we're only talking about the strength here, so the strength of an electric field, strength of a magnetic field, <coughs> are varying sinusoidally with time. All right, we're picking up definitions of what a wave is going to be here. You can see this coming. Um, and they're varying sinusoidally. Okay, so just like we plot pressure for a sound wave and we get you know, a sinusoidal variation for whatever frequency we're talking about, so we would for an electromagnetic wave, but now, <coughs> excuse me, we've got that sinusoidal variation in an electric field and a magnetic field. Um, the two are always at right angles to one another. So the electric field and the magnetic field are at right angles to each other. And this is a transverse wave. So they are both at right angles to the direction of wave travel. Alright, so you've got to think three dimensionally here. Uh, these are the x, y and z axes if you like. And we've got mutually orthogonal directions. So electric and magnetic field at right angles to each other and both of them in their turn at right angles to the direction of the wave motion. All right, so the diagram at the bottom is trying to show you this. 
with an end on view and a sort of vaguely side uh, view. All right, now you notice they're in phase as well. When the electric field strength is high, so is the magnetic field strength. And vice versa. Um, this cartoon I did check earlier, and, and for some this might help. I don't know. I'll show it to you anyway because it won't take terribly long. <coughs> But it does it does illustrate the point. Okay, so we've got electric field along that axis, strength of the magnetic field along that axis, and the direction of wave propagation is then on this axis here. Right, it's coming out from a source, a point source in the middle, so it's coming out in both directions. All right, so our electric field strength is just oscillating as that green dot is illustrating sinusoidally up and down. Uh, magnetic fields, likewise, uh, it's going, you know, uh, sinusoidally along that direction. They're at right angles to each other, and um, at right angles to the to the uh, to the motion. All right, so. Uh, I'm not sure if we get this lined up properly. No, it's not good enough for that. Um, but that's essentially how it's operating. Okay, so everyone content with that as a basic definition of an electromagnetic wave. Good. Okay, now, um, the stuff that we see with our eyes, white light as we would um, describe it, we know we can split up. All right? So we can get a source of white light <coughs> Excuse me. Put it through a prism, and we can get the classic spectrum of colours coming out the other side. Everybody knows that, and that's caused by dispersion. All right. So here's our first generic wave thing that we've translated into a specific. We get dispersion with light as well, but actually that visible part of the spectrum is a tiny uh, part of the overall spectrum, which is what I'll show you. Uh, later on, right? We can actually stick a thermometer, and I'll show you the sort of thermometer that gets <coughs> used outside the red end of the spectrum. So if we go back to our prism here, we can stick a thermometer there and actually be a thermocouple, uh, and we can measure a temperature rise. So there's obviously some energy out there as well that we can't see, but it's present. All right? Uh, we're pretty sure there's energy out here beyond the blue end of the visible spectrum, you know, you detect that if you spend too long on the beach uh, in the summer. Right? There are bits of your skin that respond to ultraviolet light. Um, and, you know, there's other things as well, like right? fluorescence and, and so on. So if we have a look at the EM spectrum as a whole, <coughs> this is what it looks like. Now notice that it, this is on a logarithmic scale of wavelength. So this is absolutely huge. There's, there's more than 18 orders of magnitude of wavelength here. Absolutely phenomenal. So we're going all the way from um, at one end of the scale to something. Anyone care to tell me what this corresponds to vaguely as a length scale? 10 to the minus 15 of a meter. Remember last term? Yeah. Yes. yeah. So we're going from wavelengths that are of the order of the diameter of a nucleus at one end of our spectrum out to kilometers <coughs> at the other end. <coughs> yeah? So this is absolutely huge, huge, huge range. Uh, and what our eyes pick up, of course, is this, this little bit in the middle uh, between, you know, about 350 and 750 nanometers. Right, which is great. I mean, it's really useful to better pick up that sort of light. But there's a lot of it to either side. And you'll notice, I mean, just notice how wide the range is that is referred to as infrared. Right? It's enormous. <coughs> the visible part. Just that bit alone. A ditto ultraviolet. Right? So we're going to talk through these things, these regions, in a little bit more detail. Um, you know, what the parameters are associated with them, where they come from, how we detect them, that sort of stuff. Uh, and we'll probably get through that today. But 
our basic wave equation is exactly the same, right? C equals F lambda pertains here also. Right? These are all just waves, and they are all electromagnetic waves, and they all behave, you know, using the same relationships that we had for all the other waves we've looked at. So wave speed still equals frequency times wave length. Uh, the energy still is Planck's constant times frequency, E equals HF, right? which we've also used. All of that's true, all the way along that spectrum. Um, so, I'm, this, this is going to be a couple of tables like this, they're really, really detailed, so um, I'm sorry about that. But it's just to give you a bit of uh, a filling in, I suppose, of those values. So we've got uh, frequency, wavelength, energy, right? So the two equations I've told you about so far, C equals F lambda and E equals HF. Right? You could calculate these numbers. In fact, I believe I might even have set an exam question in the past where I put one of these tables in with some bilinks and said fill them in. Right? It is just those two equations. There's nothing special here, but this gives you, I suppose, a ballpark feel. Uh, for what we're talking about. So um, <coughs> you're way too young, I guess, most of you, unless you're into test match special on long wave radio 4, which I am, I confess, uh, to have listened to long wave radio. Right? So a classic valve radio set, for instance, will be set up really well for long wave. All right? So that's where we're talking about kilometers for a wave. <coughs> okay? Um, and very, very small energy to the photons, 10 to the minus 28 joules, as you'll see up there. Okay, now all that's happening to create, um, again, I'll come back to this in some more detail later on, to create or detect this electromagnetic wave is electrons moving in a piece of wire. It's the classic Faraday and Maxwell experiment. Actually, Maxwell was more of a theorist, but certainly the Faraday experiments. All right, so we get an electron moving in a wire. That's creating an oscillation in the electric field, right, as the electron moves, which is itself inducing an oscillation at right angles in a magnetic field, travelling outwards, hitting the neighbouring wire, and the oscillating electric field in the electromagnetic wave as it hits this second wire causes electrons in that wire to oscillate up and down in phase with the change in the electric field. So we've had a current over here which has created an EM wave. That EM wave has propagated outwards to another wire <coughs> and caused an oscillating current in that wire. Right? That's the whole of radio and TV propagation in a nutshell. Okay? That's why we have metallic areas. Because we need somewhere for electrons to oscillate. Okay? Now, as I say, I'm going to come back to this in a little bit more detail later on. But that's essentially it. Uh, and then we come all the way down through um, VHF, so you know this is most of the FM radio that you listen to. UHF, which is television band, um, uh, into microwaves. Well, you know, close approach radar, cooking, uh, all of that stuff is coming out of microwaves. Uh, into infrared, so you know this is thermal radiation, if you like. It's also what a lot of your TV remote controllers will use. <coughs> you know, short, short distance communication and so on. Um, and you can see the energy is uh, changing somewhat, all right? We're up, what are we up now? Nine orders of magnitude of energy. We're up to of the order of an electron volt now, um, when we get down to here. Uh, and then we're going to go out the other, other end, as it were, so we get to visible. We're a few electron volts. You remember we talked about sunlight as being somewhere in the 2 EV type region when we had an estimate, made an estimate of the surface temperature of the sun uh, into ultraviolet. So we're going up a little bit in energy 
uh, um, X-rays, we're into kilovolts now and tens of kilovolts, and then gamma rays, megavolts, uh, cosmic rays, you know, higher. 